It's an interesting question, um, the, the relation to wine. I would like to even maybe shift that question somewhat slightly and say it's not even a question of wine, but let's talk about the relation to spirit. Because I find it very interesting that wine is classified as a spirit. Um, and so is beer. Now you might recall that in 1995, one of the things I did was uh, make a self-portrait, which is a broken bottle of Heineken beer. Um, it was just the bottle, just the bottleneck. Um, and it's one of the most important works I made because it's called self-portrait. It's the only work I ever made called self-portrait. I've made a lot of works which use my body, which use my face, which interrogate my identity, which interrogate my, what it is, my, my, my place in the world from a physical point of view. But I've only ever made one self-portrait. And it's always interesting when I travel somewhere around the world and people give me a bottle of Heineken beer. Um, and I have to explain to them, no, I actually don't like beer. You know, part of that process of naming is also self-loathing. One doesn't necessarily have to love oneself. But I'm very interested since a very early day um, in this process of how art gets conjured, how we bring art into existence. And part of that process is somehow Dionysiac. Part of that process is somehow in order to release yourself, in order to open yourself to channel something beyond your control. And the only thing that um, Bacchus or Dionysus hated more than people who don't drink or people who drink too much. And there's that very fine moment between being in control and losing control. That is the, 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 let's say, the process of losing your sobriety. And this is very much for me what the artistic process is about, is one has to lose the sobriety, one has to switch off the cerebral policeman. You have to switch off the policeman that senses um, your ideas of what is real or not real, what is permissible or not permissible what you can and what you can't do in order to release something greater than you are. So the process of the, the, the Dionysiac, the revelry, the, the, this, this, this ecstatic God, you know, ecstasis is out of the static, out of the ordinary, out of the quotidian. And the, you know, wine for me is one of the greatest um, symbols of that process of release. You know, it was used as a symbol by, by, by Jesus at the Last Supper. It's a form of baptism. It's a form of sharing. It's something you can um, take in the community. It's something you can take for religious purposes. And it's something that you can take in, in excess. Um, and so my relationship to wine is a very interesting one, you know, especially the red wine, which is the metaphor of the blood, the metaphor for the spirit. It is a spirit and, a, and it's a metaphor for spirit. Um, and so the you know, the, the opportunity of coming to Ima or being here and, and, and seeing how the seasons, how the time, how the nature, how the sun, how the light, how the water, how the earth gets embodied and finds its alchemy in the wine it was a very inspiring and beautiful moment. Um, and that moment to find a connection between my process and the process of making wine. And they, they, they're not dissimilar. It is fighting your raw materials, listening to your elements, trying to find the spirit of your raw materials in order to then transform into something else. The alchemy from lead into gold. I always have a problem with the word site-specific because it generally presupposes that a work of art has been made for a site. And in thinking about the work in those terms, you're not, it's, it's, for instance, I have a huge problem with the word found object for the same reason. Because what the found object does is it transforms the ego of the artist into something monumental. I find, therefore, it exists. As if there is no such thing before the artist arrives and declares. Um, I prefer to, instead of using the word found object, I prefer to use the word lost object because the lost object presupposes that life before it encountered the artist. And in that way, there's respect to that whole history that has to be accounted for, that has to be discussed and, take, and, and thought about in order to decode what that object is. So the artist is in that way participating in a, greater, in a, in a bigger narrative than their ego declaring, I find, therefore it is. And the same with site-specific. Indeed, a lot of the works that I make is very specifically connected to a place. But the place is not the point. The place is the dialogue between me and the place. 
the dialogue with the history, the dialogue with my history, the history of the place, these two things intersecting, these two narratives that come together in a very precise moment in time where you have these two worlds overlapping and creating a new dialogue. So the work is made very specifically for the site, but the site has a history and one needs to acknowledge that history, respect that history, break that history, challenge that history and in the same way allow yourself to be challenged allow yourself to be challenged by those histories. So, so it's in that dialogue that the works for me, that are the, the strongest works at Castello di Alma are coming to being because it's these intersections, these two paths which meet at the crossroad. Um, and I think that for the future, the, you know, to ask the question, how do I see it going? I think it is very much about the dialogue because the work of art doesn't begin or end on the physical site where the work gets installed. The work of art is the dinner, the lunch, the discussions, the, the, the wine, the, 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 the air, the, the, the silence, the crickets, the cicadas, the, the birds. It's everything, all of these things need to be part of that site. And one cannot offset the nature from the art that moves in. I think very often what we call site-specific art looks like something that fell from Mars and landed in a, in a place with the ego of the artist saying, I made it for you, therefore it's site-specific. It's the fragile dialogue of of thinking about connection, which, if, which is about empathy, which is about, about the artist opening themselves up to the spirit of this place and allowing the spirit of this place to collaborate in the pre production or the creation of something which is that beautiful conversation between time and place and experience. I think that the catharsis that you're speaking about is really a process of manifesting. There is a difference between the works that have been made for outside or the works that are made for inside. And these are perhaps speaking about different kinds of spaces, an inner space or an outer space, an esoteric or an exoteric. And of course then there's the beautiful work of Kabakov, which is somehow between inside and outside. You have this, this dialogue which is it's simultaneously the two. And in order to see the work inside you have to look through the telescope in order to look into somebody else's world to go through the, the, the telescope in order to see something that might not be apparent to the naked eye. But I think if you think about Chen Zen or Louise Bourgeois or my work, these, or even the pistoletta with the mirrors, these, these, these works deal with an inner space. Almost, it's almost a meditation. It's almost about the time that it takes for the wine to transform into, for the grapes to transform into wine. This takes time and there's no fast forward and it needs to be in relation to the barrels which were trees that were outside that they were enrolled into into these barrels which then becomes this inner space this inner space of transformation this inner space where the alchemy can take place where something unfolds and opens in order to become something quite different on the outside you have the element of nature which comes in and adds moss it adds um, the traces of animals, it adds the traces of, of time in a different kind of way as the weathering and the seasoning takes place. Um, it's a different process. There, for instance, on the House of Spirits, which is a work outside, um, there what I've done is I have these two spaces. The outside space is protecting the inside space, and you have then the two forms of metal. The metal which is made to resist the nature, which retains its uh, silvery, galvanized appearance, the fence, the border, the blades, and then you have the metal which is rusting, and there the metal becomes part of nature. So there you see the dialogue between human desire to resist change and then nature coming in to, to, to create its own dialogue, its own battle. Um, and then you have this house of spirits which is somehow a prison, but also I like to think of it as a spirit catcher where the spirits are protected from us. They're given a space to live free of us, that where we, we're not able to interfere with them. Um, and in that way, they can guide us better because they have the space to be able to be free to guide us. Because one of the great dangers of human beings is that we will try always to control nature. Instead of working with nature, we work against nature. And that's perhaps also the dialogue of the inner space where you surrender to something greater than yourself within. And the works on the outside is more a case of permitting things greater than yourself to be able to evolve in dialogue with you in order to collaborate with what it is that you've created.
It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful question about the, the 32 sides because yes, you have the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and then the 10 numbers, zero through to nine. And that makes up our esoteric worldview because according to the gematria, every letter has a number and every number is a letter and it then becomes a code. And according to the Kabbalah, the, you know, it's all about yod heh vah the secret unpronounceable name of God. And how might one be able to put that name together in order to um, understand the divine secrets, the divine nature of reality. Um, but what's interesting, what's really beautiful about the, you, you point out the 32, but don't forget that it's the house of spirits. So there's a point in the center that you don't talk about. And that's the 33rd point. That's the point of completion because that's the thing that the 32 are. Because when you also in, in mysticism, esotericism, you, you, know, you have your four directions, then you have your up and your down. But the last one is always the inside. Apartheid was legislated in 1948, the same year as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and apartheid gave a name to racism. Apartheid has always existed. It was called slavery. It has been around since there were human beings. Since the first humans decided to um, create their farms and stop being um, nomadic and create um, a sedentary life, with that they created a border. And as soon as there was a border, there was people on this side of the border and people on that side of the border. And so racism gets born. You're either with us or you're against, against us. As civilizations evolved and grew, so the idea of the outsider became more and more of a threat. And as civilizations grew differently, so you had differences of culture, differences of food, differences of clothing and appearances, which led to differences in smell, differences in the way one approaches having a body, being in time and space, and how one interacts with one another. For some cultures to eat with a knife and fork is barbaric. For other cultures to eat with your hands is barbaric. Um, and based on these differences, we, we, we give a name to our racism, which we now call apartheid. Yes, 1990 apartheid ended. It was delegislated. Today, it's against the law in South Africa to be racist. But that doesn't take the policeman out of the head. When I spoke earlier about the role of Bacchus, Dionysus, and alcohol, um, and there's a beautiful quote um, by Alistair Crowley where he says, when the artist gets drunk, they reveal their genius. When a normal person gets drunk, they just become crazy. And it's that process of un unlocking your sensor board, unlocking your perceptions, unlocking your fears, unlocking your sense of what is right and wrong, that allows the artist to release something which is more than three dimensions and five senses. And it's very much this, th these ideas in our head which are created by habit, which are created by what we call normal, which are created by what we call common sense, created by what we assume to be right and wrong, which is simply the fears of our ancestors speaking through us, teaching us to hate this or love that. Um, and in Opening that policeman, one then surrenders to a process which is non-racist, non-sexist, non-classist, in order to open up experience to things which are beyond what you think you can imagine, beyond what you think you can control. But actually we are capable of so much more than what we give ourselves permission for.